Good evening. Welcome to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia, a place where we nurture curiosity and strengthen community. It's a joy to see all of you gathered here for our first post-COVID, for some of us, not me, Moss Symposium. <laughs> I'm Beth Hessel, the Executive Director, and it is truly a delight to see all of you gathered here and look forward to what we will all learn this evening and tomorrow as part of this symposium. I would like to welcome the HAB staff who are here. If you would raise your hand so we could uh, welcome you. The American Institute of Architects Historic Resources Committee. Why don't you raise your hand if you're here. And Athenaeum members and friends, raise your hand if you're here. That should be everybody. <laughs> and a very hearty welcome and congratulations to the 2023 Charles E. Peterson prize-winning student teams and their advisors. Why don't you all stand up? You all have accomplished an amazing feat with these historic drawings that you have created to add to our historic resources at the Library of Congress. Thank you. The Athenaeum last hosted the Peterson Prize Awards in 2016 as we marked with our colleagues the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. This year, the Athenaeum is proud to celebrate the 90th anniversary of the creation of HABs and the 40th anniversary of the Charles E. Peterson Prize. Tonight and tomorrow, you'll have an opportunity to learn a great deal about the role that Peterson and the Athenaeum played in the historic preservation movement, not just in Philadelphia, but nationwide. And you'll have an opportunity to view not just one, but two exhibitions that commemorate these dual anniversaries. Like a book, a symposium does not come together without the support of many individuals. A special thanks tonight to the HABS staff, and in particular, Daniel D'Souza, for designing and fabricating the Blazing the Trail exhibition in our Haas Gallery. Daniel, I know you're here. <laughs> the Athenaeum exhibition, 40 Years of the Charles E. Peterson Prize, can be seen on the first floor and basement gallery space. And special thanks go to Athenaeum staff, Tess Galen, who signed you in. Jim Carroll and Christina Doe. Christina, wave your hand. And our intern, Meijing Hunt Babcock, raise your hand um, from Drexel for their design, printing, fabrication, and installation of this impressive show. Thank you, too, to the late Robert McNeil Jr., who underwrote the funds which today make the Moss Symposium possible. Last but not least, a huge round of applause belongs to our Bruce Laverty, Gladys Brooks Curator of Architecture. For 40 years, Bruce has emblazoned the path at the Athenaeum, building our physical and digital architecture collections. He has stewarded a vast reservoir of knowledge about the built environment of Philadelphia and its architects who led national and global innovations in architecture. He has aided historians, preservationists, architects, students, and the casually curious to plumb the riches of our collections. And he has served as a teacher and a colleague and an advocate at our local universities and with the city. Bruce is a very modest person and not one to toot his own horn. But as he prepares to leave his post after 40 years, to enjoy some new adventures with his wife, Wendy, and his family. We all know that his impact on this organization, the HABS program, and this city is immeasurable. We have a guest book at our front desk, and I know he's gonna kill me for saying all of this. 
I said Bruce is very modest and didn't want a scene. But we have a guest book at the front desk, and I invite all of you to leave your words of gratitude for Bruce in that book while you are here. But for now, I invite you to join me in a warm welcome and applause of thanks to the chief organizer, organizer and host of our symposium, Bruce Laverty. Ford beat me by a year. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> um, and I'm here to talk about Ford tonight. Uh, C. Ford Petrus is a, an historian of art, architecture, and design, and during a 41-year tenure, you know, when I started here in 1983, I didn't wear glasses. But it was that TRS-80 Model 2 <laughs> that, uh, that did me in. During a 41-year tenure as curator of the Library of Congress, he defined and expanded its architecture, design, and engineering collections through the addition of over three million items. Three million items. Uh, these acquisitions included additions to the HABS survey uh, and to the Historic American Engineering Record and the creation of the American, uh, Historic American Landscape Survey. Uh, Petrus has published and lectured in these subject areas for a wide and international range of uh, audiences uh, and broadcast media and helped to organize and fund major traveling exhibitions uh, on the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and Charles and Ray Eames. Uh, by the way, in terms of travel, traveling exhibitions, what a gig that was. Every time I would call you Ford, they'd say, oh, he's traveling. <laughs> he's in Beijing, or he's in Zimbabwe, or he's in Vienna, or he's in wherever. And I, I thought, junket guy. Yeah. <laughs> I said, the Library of Congress must have an enormous travel, uh, travel budget. So I was very, very uh, envious of you. But um, I was very also pleased that so many times our, our circles uh, crossed. So Ford. Welcome. <laughs> thank, thank you, Bruce. Um, yes, my, I beat you by one year, but my predecessor beat me by two. <laughs> she was there for 43 years. So I don't know how long Mari, my successor, will be there, but she sent me three emails about this event, <laughs> and I have to share it with you. So please notice the screen on the 15th, there's a webinar that you can all sign on to, and Bruce said he would be happy to forward the link because it has one of those little bars you scan at the bottom, because the actual link itself, you see, no one could ever write that down and get it correct. So. Um, uh, we've developed a strategy, which is what actually we all do in all of our work all the time. <laughs> um, I've taken care of the webinar business, and now I would like to thank the Athenaeum and its staff for putting together this program. Doo -doo -doo -doo. There we are. Um, and for its support all these years of the Peterson Prize of the Historic American Building Survey, and for so many other contributions to the appreciation and understanding of American architecture. It's been my pleasure and privilege over the years to work in many capacities and on many projects with Sandra Tatman, Roger Moss, and Bruce Laverty. These have included the Cooperative Preservation of Architectural Records, known as COPAR, various exhibitions and publications. And in 2014, um, the design competition reimagining the Athenaeum of Philadelphia and the Athenaeum's bicentennial events. My presentation today is entitled, David in the Land of Goliath, the life of a small federal program, the Historic American Building Survey, or HABS which I've been involved with for a very long time. Um, I apologize ahead of time that 
because as one gets on, one wants to share stories that if you don't, they won't ever be heard. So there's a, a bit of a personal side to my presentation today uh, uh, towards the Library of Congress and, and myself, but truly Habs has been a David in the face of a giant and its survival has been remarkable. And there, its very makeup is one of the, uh, of having, which may be unique, a government agency that has a private sector partner and a public sector partner, the Library of Congress, but legislative branch, not executive. And it allows um, its friends to help it out. We don't know that David had a lot of friends. <laughs> uh, he got the job done um, and, and he survived and went on to, of course, greater things. Um, unique factors in the support structure and mission of the Historic American Building Survey have allowed it to survive and prosper for almost a, a century. Can you imagine that? A century. As a relatively small program within a large executive branch department. We're going to see a little story about that later. And as the partner of the Library of Congress in the legislative branch and the American Institute of Architects in the private sector. I quote now appropriately from Charles E. Peterson, whom I worked with for his essay for the 50th anniversary publication of For Habs Historic America. Quote, the Historic American Building Survey did not begin in a bureaucratic routine. And if you knew Charles, you could hear him saying this. <laughs> it was founded a half century ago by a handful of public servants in a burst of idealism and energy. Distinction was achieved through the immediate and generous help of outside friends who agreed that it would be fine to build a treasury of American architectural information. Under the conditions that prevail today, it probably could not have been started. Looking back over a half century, one sees that the years have taken their toll and the people who created the survey have mostly gone to their Rewards, as a second round went down to, and a third. Their written records have been hustled off to oblivion by efficiency experts. A large and forgetful bureaucracy has grown up and Habs has been able to survive only by good luck as it staggers from one interior department reorganization to another. <laughs> Don't hold back, Charles. <laughs> If it had not made so many friends, and that's the word I'm gonna keep talking about, in the early days, the survey would probably have expired long ago, like all the other New Deal programs of the 1930s. As the survey looks to the future, my presentation today will discuss some of the aspects of this unprecedented arrangement, as well as a number of the program's past challenges and significant achievements, especially from the point of view and through the actions of one of those friends and partners, the Library of Congress. Appropriate, I believe, appropriately, I believe, my remarks are informed in particular by my 41 years in the prints and photographs division of the library, where I was often responsible for or involved with new initiatives and special programs and publications involving the preservation service and dissemination of the HABS records. Often I was called upon to represent the library's role as one of the three parties to the tripartite agreement under which the survey has operated since its inception in 1933 and 34. All of this has, I think, provided me an insight, a special insight into the origins and development of HABs and its sister programs, HARE and HALS, the Historic American Engineer Record and the Historic American Landscape Survey, for those of you who are, who are not acronym prone. <laughs> That's one of the first things I had to learn in government was stop talking in acronyms. Of course, from the beginning, the primary responsibility of the Library of Congress for the Historic American Building Survey documentation has been the preservation of its records and their service to the public. Today, I am able to discuss but a few. I mean, they just go on and on when you rack up 90 years. Uh, 
dissemination efforts through printed copies early on, then microfilm and microfiche in the 1970s, and massive programs of digitation, digitization and online sharing. I haven't been to a bar. <laughs> and online sharing beginning in the 1990s, yet. <laughs> Through a series of publications, catalogs in 1938, 41, 59, 76, that was a hair catalog, 83 and 94. Through state catalogs and all measure of other publications and online sites, beginning with Built in America at the Library of Congress in 1998 with exhibitions, symposia, press releases, and all sorts of special programs, beginning with radio talks by Leicester or Lester B. Holland in the late 1930s. Most recently, with the 10 of the 11 volumes of richly illustrated Norton Library of Congress, source books in architecture, design, and engineering, all drawing heavily on Hab's hair and even Hal's documentation beginning with Barnes in 2003 and culminating with American Libraries in 2016. Here are the guys, Lester Holland and Charles E. Peterson. And Holland wore two hats. He represented the Library of Congress and the American Institute of Architects. <laughs> um, and uh, he had gotten his start in the 20s, one of the reasons the collection came to the Library of Congress is Holland set, what, set up a system he, for gathering architectural draw, photographs from all over the country, the pictorial archives of early American architecture. And what do you, how do you file them? How do you get people to them? Well, you file them by, you make up a number by state, county, city, or vicinity, and, build, and building name. And actually, a lot of the Habs records the first photograph is number four, and the first three are in the pictorial archives, because they shared that. Well, when they decided to start HABS, it was the only place that had any kind of system that would work for organizing these materials for service. I mean, Peterson was the one who was so big about using the standardized formats. Um, uh, this is another collection Holland brought in, he got money from the Carnegie Corporation to commission Francis Benjamin Johnston to go through eight southern states with an eight by 10 camera, producing almost 7,000 large format photographs of buildings that were sinking into the ground um, uh, because of neglect in many cases. Here we have, um, one of the, uh, the, the amazing amount of publicity uh, on the left, one of the 1930s articles uh, on the, the nascent Historic American Building Survey, and then at the time of the 75th anniversary, Where We Live, Jack Larkin's book. And this is just a little outline of the three different sections and what their aspects are, but the part of the genius is and Charles Peterson told me it came out of the, they were horrified when, they, when people tried to use the records produced by the Survey of London because they made these gorgeous publications and then everything got thrown on shelves <laughs> in just helter skelter and no one could ever find anything again. And it was that that gave them a sort of reverse model for what not to do with Historic American Building Survey. And so every drawing had a reproducible, every photograph had a negative, and of course the data pages could be copied in various ways. Here are the photographs and negatives. And again, I will mention a few, uh, and through here, the preservation part and sort of I go through a timeline of the various things that the library has had to do over the years to preserve the materials as we learn more and more about how ephemeral even archival records can be. And there are your data pages. I mean, one of the problems we came up with, with in the um, 1970s when uh, it was uh, 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 government pay for clerk typists was so low um, that there were enormous amount of mistakes made on the Habs hair data pages and they were they used white out which meant that the letters fell off <laughs> <laughs> 
So we asked for a copy. One of the few instances we asked Habs to make a copy because if we only took the original, who knows what it would say in 10 or 15 years. <laughs> In analyzing the part about dissemination, who is your audience? And that's constant, something one is constantly asking uh, oneself in an institution like the Library of Congress. Scholars, students, practitioners, owners, preservationists, general public, and K through 12, which only presented itself with that term for us in the 1990s, but it changed the world especially in terms of uh, uh, getting resources to do the things we wanted to do. In 2000, the library was instrumental in the creation of HALS, the Historic American Landscape Survey, this time with the American Institute of, Landscape, of Architects as the private sector partner. Likewise, we pushed for the establishment of an annual Lester B. Holland Prize for the best single sheet measured drawing created for Habs Hero House. It is supported by the Paul Rudolph Trust in the Library of Congress. Of course, our inspiration was the Peterson Prize uh, and its Center for Architecture, Design and Engineering. Uh, so uh, the, the prize actually took five years from suggestion to get it going, but it's the idea of uh, a student in a much shorter time can, or, but actually our first entry was from a professional do uh, a single sheet drawing, but it's also the great challenge, like in Bozar competition, to get all that information on one page. And it can sometimes, as you'll see with the first winner, which I'll show you at the end, um, a, a wonderful exercise. So starting out, the delivery channels were fairly simple, but in the 1970s, they grew to include microfilm and uh, microfiche. I am happy to report that as of this October, the work in disseminating these materials is spectacular in terms of its results and the breadth of use for these collections. For about six decades, from the 1930s through the early 90s, rarely more than a few dozen or a few hundred researchers used the prints and photographs division of the library to consult the sites and structures documented in the measure drawings, photographs, and pages of written data produced by Habs and Hare. In 1998, President Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act. Um, uh, in the main reading room of the library's Jefferson Building, sorry, in January 3rd, 1996, with the creation of the World Wide Web and the internet thereafter, and the library's ambitious goal to digitize at least five million items, in its collections by its bicentennial in 2000, multiple initiatives, pilot programs, and fundraising efforts were launched. Librarian of Congress James H. Billington was determined to push its, his institution and its staff and collections into the digital age, even if it was kicking and screaming. Librarians like stasis, <laughs> you know. And the next few decades represented anything but that. The work had begun as early as 1982 with the optical disc pilot project, producing an electronic reference station in the prints and photographs division by 1983. After 1994, curators and specialists were charged to select 200 collections as prime candidates for what came to be known as the National Digital Library Program and thereafter the American Memory Project. To achieve these goals, the Library of Congress requested $15 million in appropriated funds over five years and planned to raise $45 million from the private sector. As of April 1996, commitments for $20 million had been made by individuals, corporations, and foundations. Because of its interest in K through 12 education, the Kellogg Foundation, when approached for funding, replied that it was more interested in collections that teachers would like to see made available and paid for them to come to the library in search of the same. Guess what? Heb's hair ranked high among their selections. Because of its commitment to engineering education, I suggested there's the Built in America project from the late 90s. 
here you see some of these res staggering results we began to get afterwards. And this is the announcement um, of the Shell Grant. Um, because of its commitment to ed engineering education, I suggested that the library go to the Shell Foundation. And in 1998, they donated $500,000 of, as I said to Bruce, 1990s dollars <laughs> to digitize the documents um, in the Historic American Engineering Record. By 2002, this additional funded funding Funding allowed the digitization of all process drawings received from 1933 to 2000. With limited server space, special challenges appeared. For example, a great deal of time and energy had to be given to finding a way to accurately scan only the inked areas in the measured drawings. How about that? Not the white backgrounds as well which produced a much smaller size file for storage in a TIFF format. Today, we don't worry about storage so much, but back then it was a huge issue. And we got given two surplus servers by the Navy Department, <laughs> you know, to put this stuff on. 1997 to 2001, the history and photo caption pages were digitized. 1998 to 2001, the black and white negatives were digitized. 2001 to 2011, the architectural drawings were digitized. 2001 to present, the text pages were converted to searchable PDFs. New transmittals include digital histories, photo caption pages, and architectural drawings. And on and on. So, the incremental growth in access to HABs and later hair and house documentation has gone like this. If you look at the catalogs. 1941, 6,389 structures. 1979, 20,000 sites and structures. Now that's a Chadwick Healy microfiche publication. 1982, Historic America falls down a bit. It has 16,738 sites and structures. 1994, with America preserved, 30,097 structures. 2008, over 35,000 structures and sites. And in 2023, as of last month, 45,537 structures and sites. That's in a single month in October, 2023. 526,000 Habs Hair Hell page views were take, seen out of a total of 1.3 million and 72 other collections in PNP. 120,000 unique visitors looked at the Habs records last month online. 7,981 7, from the US, 111 from Canada, 93 from the UK, 45 from Germany, 39 from India, 38 from France, 37 from Australia, 32 from Japan, da 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 <laughs> It goes on and on. I mean, from the reading room where the people would, you know, a few people would come in every day. We have people from all over the world, 24 seven, consulting the records that you young people just won a prize for, or about to. <laughs> Over 8,000 searches were done in last month for Hab's hair and house. 500 searches for falling water. <laughs> 209 searches for Philadelphia. 139 searches for city halls. 132 searches for plantation. <laughs> 79 searches for Gothic church. <laughs> in the single average day in October 2023, there were 3,872 visitors a day versus hundreds before the 1990s. 164 of these were from Philadelphia alone. <laughs> so, 5% of the page views for the prints and photographs to, uh, vision uh, are for the Historic American Buildings Survey and its sister programs. Um, it remains the top one, two, or three used collections 
in the prints and photographs division out of all the millions of items. My journey within all of this began, here we get personal, <laughs> in the fall of 1975, when Alan Fern, chief of the prints and photographs division, and later director of the library's special collections, and then director of the National Portrait Gallery, brought me on as a cataloger of the architectural collections. Within a few years, I proposed that architectural collections provided a too limited description of the library's current holdings, including the historic American engineering record and its planned acquisition of the vast archives of the designers Charles and Ray Eames. My suggestion that they would be more usefully understood as the architecture, design, and engineering collections was accepted, and thereafter my position was redescribed as curator of the same, and the acronym ADE was adopted for the name of a new filing series. Nothing, nothing in this world makes a librarian's heart beat faster <laughs> than the creation of a new filing series. <laughs> it is akin to Minerva bursting forth from the head of Zeus. <laughs> Some of my initial goals were to expand and build the collections, to make them easier to use through dissemination of copies and surrogates, to bring greater attention to them through publications and exhibitions, to promote their preservation through housing and storage, to increase intellectual access through improved subject access indexing and vocabularies, to garner outside support for acquisitions, dissemination, conservation, and special programs. Whew. During the four decades, I recommended and guided the library's acquisition of more than 400 acquisitions, totaling over 4 million items if you count the ones I recommended for other divisions in the library. <laughs> um, these included engineering drawings, photographs, manuscripts, and supplemental materials, all the while cl clearly pacing Hab square in the middle of an increasingly rich mother load as I began to describe this agglomeration in the early 1980s. The great majority of these acquisitions were considered as complementing, supporting, and filling gaps in the measured drawings, photographs, and written historical information of the Historic American Building Survey and later HALS. They represent building types, as in the 1,100 1, American examples in 48 states documented in the Seagram County Courthouse Archive, to see up there. The thousands of design drawings in the uh, Iron Craftsman Collection are about materials. Thousands of ephemeral and roadside structures are documented in the John Margulies Archive. Color images, Middle America, and the work of major form givers such as Frank Lloyd Wright and Eero Saarinen are represented in the over 500,000 photographs in the Balthasar Korab archive. And what will grow to be over 100 high resolution color images of the built environment, inhabitants, and natural and man-made landscapes throughout the United States in the Carol M. Highsmith 21st Century America project. Unlike Habs, Hare, and House, the great majority of the images in these collections are in the public domain, free for use by students, researchers, and practitioners across the country and around the world. Also included are the special format collections of the former Engineering Society's Library in New York, the drawings, photographs, and rare books and periodicals of the American Institute of Architects, American Architectural Foundation in Washington. Substantial holdings of the archives and papers of the designers Charles and Ray Eames and Raymond Lowy, the architects Richard Morris Hunt, Cass Gilbert, Charles Goodman, Paul Rudolph, I.M. Pei, and Victor Lundy, and of the photographers Sigurd Fisher, Norman McGrath, Philip Traeger, and Camillo Jose Fergara. I have been fortunate along the way in working with all of this to benefit from the knowledge of many mentors. They included the kindly, humorous, and nurturing, nurturing Sir Ellis Waterhouse, son of the famous British architect and former director of the National Gallery of Scotland, who was the Samuel H. Crest Professor in residence at the National Gallery of Art while I was a Crest Professor, Crest Fellow there from 1974 to 75, and who provided a very generous recommendation letter for me to the Library of Congress. 
During my six months between positions at the National Gallery and the Library of Congress, I worked for something called the Dunlap Society, run by the distinguished author, professor of architectural history, and former director of the Museum of Modern Art, Bates Lowry. Among other things, we collaborated to conceive and establish what is now the National Building Museum. Oliver Jensen, former editor of Life Magazine and co-founder of American Heritage Magazine, was my chief from 1981 to 83 and greatly improved my writing skills, especially during the editing of Historic America, the Habs 50th anniversary publications. In terms of guiding principles, however, some of the most durable came from my next boss at the Library of Congress, Renata Fitztum Shaw, a Finnish German American and a direct descendant of Charlemagne, <laughs> whose family had occupied the Fitztum palaces in both Dresden and Vienna. Impressed by the weight of and heraldic marks on the Fitztum silver, a southern dinner guest once posed a question to Renata. Royalty? <coughs> Renata merely shook her head and replied, nobility. <laughs> Not unlike a Valkyrie, Renata dispensed Teutonic maxims that were both memorable and instructive. All suffering was relative for her, and she had little tolerance for whining. Once when someone complained that the American naturalization process had proven difficult for them, she replied, at least you did not have to renounce all your titles. <laughs> that ended that conversation. Ask if one should request support or funding for a project, she was known to reply, the quiet child starves. <laughs> Best of all, however, was Wenn der Kopf dumm ist, leidet der ganze Körper, which means when the head is stupid, the whole body suffers. <laughs> that one you can take home with you. <laughs> Thus, a boy from North Carolina who loved to read Bullfinch's mythology with a flashlight under the covers after lights out, discovered and learned to navigate a new Olympus filled with sometimes godlike characters with a seemingly equivalent range of histories, ambitions and insecurities, powers and egos, and escapades and foibles. One of these was Charles Peterson of Society Hill, Philadelphia. <laughs> So, today I bring you a few additional recollections to provide additional context to the use of Habs and hair. Try to look back and picture the fine arts reading room of the Library of Congress in the 1930s. Here we have it earlier. It was in the, one of the great pavilions of the Jefferson Building. At that time, the first Habs measured drawings were filed in large, and I mean large, ring binders. <laughs> that kept the same size as the drawings themselves and were housed on shelves in the adjacent book stacks. The photographic prints were mounted on 8 by 10 cardboard mounts with typed identifying captions filed together with type data pages and similarly sized standard ring binders also filed in the adjacent book stacks. Researchers in the reading room could consult Howard's Habs card catalog with four by six index cards filled with information and sometimes even small drawings. Organized by state, county, and city of vicinity with the records for a site or structure filed in numerical order by location as were the records themselves. The card files, so it was all physical. <laughs> the card files provided what was known as a shelfless index number assigned by the library for each site or structure and its records, that system that had begun by Lester Holland for the Pictorial Archives. Using these numbers, researchers would fill out call slips for the records for a site of structure or even a whole town, and these would be delivered to them by any staff member at large tables in the reading room. Each photograph and each drawing had what was called a reproducible. 
either a photographic negative or for drawings, a full-size copy from which inexpensive diazo prints or photographic copies from the original drawing could be ordered at a minimal cost. For years, the cost of an eight by 10 photo print was, what do you think? 25 cents. Of course, that was a meal in the 30s. <laughs> The system remained in place from the 30s to the 90s, as I said earlier, through moves to new reading rooms in the libraries. Uh, here's, uh, the, this is a photograph in the, this is in the uh, Madison building where we moved in uh, about 1980. And there are the th all three buildings. So we were first in the, that Southwest Pavilion is there. Then we were, on the second floor in the back side of the, what's now called the Adams Building. For a while, it was called the Jefferson Building. It's on some subway maps. Uh, so uh, then they decided to name this the Jefferson Building when this was the Madison Building. And now for 40, over 40 years, gosh, <laughs> uh, the Prince of Photographs has been on the second floor on this side of that building. Reference librarians would help researchers to consult the HABs records and to order copies from the library's photo duplication service in person and by mail and by telephone. Monthly visits and requests usually range from dozens to a few hundred. Libraries and historical societies in numerous cities, towns, and states ordered copies of all the records, 25 cents a shot, you know, records for their own uh, patrons to consult, but no digital. My predecessor at the library, Virginia Diker, who oversaw the architectural collections for over four decades, described to me with great relish how researchers from the Hollywood studios would visit the library in the late 1930s to conduct image research for their films. Following these visits, they would express their gratitude by sending huge flower arrangements to the reading room. <laughs> This must have been the case with Gone with the Wind, where the staircases for both the Wilkes family mansion, Twelve Oaks, and Aunt Pittypat's house in Atlanta are embellished with elaborately carved balusters, clearly based upon the Habs drawings for the Robert Cooper house in Marblehead, Massachusetts of 1745. Arthur Haskell's photographs and J.C. Holden's WPA measured drawings for Habs so enticed William Cameron Menzies set designers that they had hundreds of copies produced of northern enemy ballasters <laughs> for staircases that southern owners could not have afforded until the great wealth created by, in the early 19th century by Eli Whitney's cotton gin allowed the same. <laughs> and they would have been completely out of style. <laughs> but it's clearly from the Habs drawings. <laughs> Habs was born out of the desperation of the Great Depression and the fervor of the New Deal, and originally to put out-of-work architects to work. After World War II, the F and largely again through the efforts of Charles Peterson and his work on things like the American Notes, of the Society of Architectural Historians, it's regularly promoting HABs, and his work in all the different offices of the Interior Department and the National Park Service um, kept things going. Perhaps the most significant crisis, in my experience, one that threatened the very existence of Habs and Hare occurred during the Carter administration in the late 1970s. Over 600 federal advisory boards were abolished, including the Habs and Hare advisory boards in 1977. As a result of President Carter's reorganization of federal preservation programs, Habs was absorbed into the Department of Interior's newly created Heritage Conservation and Recreation Service, HCRS. You know how that? Acronym is pronounced hookers. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and Habs and Hare were in Nair. <laughs> and appointments to the Habs Advisory Board were ignored. The AIA and the Library of Congress have con contended that this violated the 30, 1934 tripartite agreement. 
Until then, for nearly 46 years, HABs had provided documentation of historic buildings through measure drawings, photographs, and research, performing an invaluable research to US preservation efforts. And all of this was at risk. The Library of Congress and the American Institute of Architects requested a meeting with HCRS director Chris Delaporte, who had come from the recreation part of, of Georgia's um, parks. At his convenience, this meeting was scheduled in terms of date and time in order to discuss these issues. And uh, when I was talking to John Burns earlier, because you gradually dig this up and you remember the things, and I was trying to think, well, who was there from the park service? And then I remembered, no one was there because he might, they might have gotten fired. <laughs> That's a, we could have the library and the AIA could call Mr. Delacourt and say, we want a meeting with you, but the Habs hair staff couldn't. <laughs> and so, uh, and we didn't want to get them in trouble. Um, AIA members like Nick Holmes of Alabama, who was three generation Habs, his, the grandson rebuilt the Mobile, the tower in the Mobile City Hall after it was blown away in a hurricane using his grandfather's Habs measure drawings. <laughs> so he was coming from Alabama. And Walker Johnson came from Chicago. He's the only one I could talk to who was there. Paid their own travel expenses. And Alan Fern and I organized the meeting. Uh, Alan's on the first one on the left in that photo up there. Um, Delaport failed to appear. We waited for an hour. And then we called, and he sent a deputy in his stead. As I recall, that poor boy was trembling. He was almost drawn, drawn and quartered by the furious group that he encountered, and perhaps he had to be institutionalized thereafter. <laughs> Nothing could have done more to convince the tripartite partners of Habs of the need to counteract what was clearly a road to oblivion and to galvanize them into action. It produced strong written responses to the Park Service from the AA leadership and the commitment from the library to produce a major publication for the survey's 50th anniversary. So there you see, this is 79, when they're announcing all of this in the AIA memo. And here in 1982, there are a lot of smiles because in 1981, Chris Delaporte and HCRS were gone. <laughs> and Habs and Hare were transferred back into the National Park Service. And Alan, uh, Library's Alan Fern, AIA Executive Vice President David Meeker, met with the new director of the Park Service, Russell Dickinson, to encourage the undoing of the dismantling and regionalization of Habs and Hare. A little measure of how successful all that was. But Habs is still here, it's still going. The peculiar organization, including both public and private friends, had served the preservation of Habs and Hare's existence and preparations for a 50th anniversary celebration proceeded in earnest. Habs produced a fine series of posters for this purpose. And this again is about friends. There's posters for the National Trust, for the Association for Preservation Technology, for the American Institute of Architects, for Habs itself, you know, getting the message out. And this was done by the office, not by the library or by the AIA. To commemorate the 50th anniversary of Habs, in 1983, the library published Historic America, Building Structures and Sites, culminating an effort begun two years earlier at a time when the program's future existence was challenged as never before. The project's other and more significant purpose was to create a publication of such size, range, and usefulness. It was a real doorstopper. <laughs> that, that it would serve to protect the program from future assaults and existence. And it's upholstered in Naugahyde. And they're all over the world because the government printing office printed these things you know, you know, there's hardly an embassy library in the world that doesn't have historic America. Um, so it, it's 100, 708 pages. <laughs> I was put in charge of, and then America Preserved is the next one that comes around 1993 for the, for the 50th anniversary, but it didn't have any essays in it. 
I was put in charge of choosing the subjects and guiding the authors of essays, including Charles E. Peterson and a number of scholars, historians, and library and park service staff. My goal here was to enlist the most capable and respected historians, experts, and practitioners to demonstrate the significance of the Habs Hair documentation in as wide a range of locations as possible and to examine both its achievements and challenges over time and into the future. A state, Louisiana, a city, Philadelphia, a resort town, Cape May, Main Street, the subjects of structural material types, bridges, cast iron, vernacular construction, a room, the kitchen, an architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, fittings and fixtures, future recording technologies, hi John, possibilities and challenges, and my own article, placing Habs and Hair documentation together with complementary documents in the collections of the Library of Congress. So, Here's, the, here's Charles E. Peterson's article. And it was a pain to get him to do this and to get him to trust me, because I was a whip, young whippersnapper. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? <laughs> um, and um, I was talking, what? Who was telling me about the, down, the, the downtown club? <laughs> where he, uh, that was, you were, you'd made it when he took you to lunch at the day. He took you, I heard De the John Burns was telling me, because he took Debbie there once. <laughs> Um, here in Philadelphia, but but once once you had his confidence, it was a, just a joy to work with him, and um, and I, I really can't imagine how we could have started that volume without him. <laughs> uh, then you had Samuel Wilson from Louisiana, who'd worked on the Habs. He was ahead of everything, and he was married to Mary Louise Latrobe. <laughs> um, George, P. T George Tatum, who taught here in, in Penn and Delaware at Williams uh, and, and had written so much on Philadelphia architecture. Uh, of course, Carolyn Pitts wrote on Cape May where she'd been involved with historic preservation. Of course, she later becomes a key person in the National Landmarks Program. Carol Rifkin had be written a very well-received book on Main Street and had been, oh, oh, the other thing is, I'd worked, almost everyone in here I helped in the reading room, just like a reference library, and that's how I got to know them. And you know, was able to, helped enormously in, A, you had shame and guilt, <laughs> because you'd help them. <laughs> but the other thing was, um, they loved the collection. I mean, they, you know, it's like helping a family member. Um, Richard Sander Allen on covered bridges. Um, Margot Gale, who was one who could charm the guilt off a ceiling or wherever it is. Um, and always carried a magnet with her. Yeah. Cast iron, nope, yep, nope, yep. <laughs> Carl Lounsbury, uh, who could talk about vernacular architecture I mean, you know, knew more than I ever imagined. Uh, well, when you're Carl Lounsbury, I believe it was the fifth. <laughs> that helps. My friend David DeLong, who I worked on many projects with over the years, um, uh, got him to work, and on other Frank Lloyd Wright projects as well as this. But he, he was then at Columbia. He later came to the Historic Preservation Department here at Penn. Um, Bob Brugman in the University of Illinois at uh, Chicago Circle, one of the brightest young scholars at the time, uh, and still going with looking at, you know, what's happening on the edges of American suburbs and so on. But, you know, he, he, he looks and, and this is the sort of, thing, sort of thing that the publishing office at the Library of Congress, well, forward, not everything he says is positive. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, John Burns on the future of recording technologies. You, well, any, any responses? Any great successes from that? I think you see them downstairs. Yeah, okay, great. And uh, uh, there's Francis Benjamin Johnson with that eight by 10 camera. Of course, the Carnegie Corporation gave her a small limousine and a driver. <laughs> um, 
Bob Caps writing on future directions of the survey, and Alicia Stam, who did the heroic job of putting together the first electronic database of, the, of everything in HABs in an impossible stretch of time. I mean, I remember meeting if we're going to make it. Is it going to happen? And then we had to transfer. And then back then, it wasn't so easy. It wasn't, oh, give me a Word file, <laughs> you know, or an Excel file, you know, to work it to go over to print. The things you remember that your mind gets stuck with. Um, and of course, here's Charles E. Peterson again with his various publications. Uh, you know, he could c carry a lot of water in that bucket. <laughs> Here are the two, um, the 1938 catalog of Habs, the very first one, partial, and the 1941 catalog. And all these things now are on internet. You know, if you want to look up any of these things, even Historic America is on the internet archive. That's where I was doing. <laughs> um, now, my, like I'd done in Historic America with these essays pointing out, the next thing was to do books versus essays on different building types and subjects. And again, largely through people and scholars and researchers that I'd worked with in the library and HABs, I was able to first, you know what, how I got them to do these books? Because I said, because it, it was always on their favorite subject or the subject they'd never got to do a book on that they'd always wanted to. And I said, I will show you things you've never seen. <laughs> and I will show you things you will never see without me. <laughs> because I'd been there for, you imagine, I knew where the bodies were buried, <laughs> if, as it were. So John Michael Blatch did the first one. Uh, who's the hus husband of Beverly Brannon, who's a photo curator in the Prints and Photographs Division, still there. And John was a great historian of, histor of uh, uh, vernacular architecture. And he went through 12,000 images, drawings and photographs of barns in the Historic American Building Survey for the whole country. And he came up with a whole new development of the American barn that was completely convincing, showing how it, the most, the, the one, the greatest solution was, was discovered in the middle Tennessee Valley, and it was exported all over the country and into Canada because it was such a great barn type. Uh, I mean, that, that's just one of the things. Bob Caps did one of his favorite subjects, canals. Um, Craig Morrison did theaters. Um, Sarah Vermeil did lighthouses, and every book, the organization of every book emerged. It, w it wasn't there in the beginning. The author might have had something, but as they found the Habs, Hare, Howells records, and the other materials in the Library of Congress, it created the organization. So hers is organized by structural types. Starts with the masonry lighthouses and ends up with the steel ones and cast iron. Bridges, Richard Cleary, it's a, you know, a, a wonderful book, and, he, and Eric Deloney of Hare did the introduction for it. Um, Christine Macy did um, one on dams. Hers is organized by drainage areas. <laughs> David Naylor did railroad stations. And the last in the series was um, uh, Kenneth Breisch, at the University of Southern California, who did American libraries. Again, one of his great loves. So this doesn't come out to 2000. So these began in 2003 to 2017. But some of them have 1,200 illustrations in them. And everything is public domain. And the first ones came with CD-ROMs with every image on them. And then they did a database online because bookstores wouldn't sell because people steal the CD-ROMs. <laughs> So they're a huge pain for the booksellers. They don't want to carry them. Go, oh, oh, where's the CD-ROM? Oh. <laughs> and here uh, for the 75th anniversary of the Historic American Building Survey, uh, uh, the library did a symposium. And it was uh, nicely the same year that the first uh, Lester Holland Prize was created. Here's Habs at 75. And there is my concluding image 
they say with a sigh of relief. <laughs> um, and, and this is the um, Buckminster Fuller's own house and his wife's own house in Carbondale, Illinois. And it's all there on that one sheet of drawing. And um, it's just an amazing drawing and something, if that isn't in the Historic American Building Survey, what should be? Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'll conclude with a few more words from our good friend, Mr. Peterson. I'm gonna skip all those statistics about when nitrate negatives were moved for Wright, Patterson, and dum, 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 because I think you may fail me. <laughs> uh, so here we go. It seems especially relevant to close this presentation with some more words that Peterson uh, shared over five decades ago at the conclusion of his essay for Historic America. And I think they work still. I am sometimes asked about the future of Habs, and I must say it now looks rather dim. The survey's advisory board was surreptitiously dropped five years ago. Now that's 55 years ago. Within the Park Service, the architectural profession has been fragmented, dispersed, and suppressed. Overhead, the weight of the highly political interior department is felt as suffocating. A general jailbreak may be the only solution. <laughs> but if its natural friends outside the federal government are encouraged to participate as they were in the beginning, there will be no end to the usefulness and growth of the Historic American Building Survey. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ford, for <clears throat> that very insightful presentation. I know we spent a number of years on the coordinating committee and I learned a lot of new things th today. So thank you for sharing. Uh, my name is Carl Stump. I'm the 2023 uh, chair of the HABS Coordinating Committee, uh, which is part of the AIA Historic Resources Committee. And I'd like to welcome you all here today. I know about a, over a year ago, we talked about um, having this symposium and celebrating the 40th and 90th. And, you know, I was a little skeptical because you always wonder, is anyone going to come? And, you know, Bruce especially um, either was confident or uh, helped, really helped assure us that, yes, this is something that is important to do and people will come. So thank you all for being here tonight and tomorrow. I'd like to share a little about the HABS Coordinating Committee and its role in not only HABS, but the Peterson Prize. Uh, the HABS Coordinating Committee is a subcommittee of the AIA Historic Resource Committee. It was formed in 1934 with a tripart agreement that Ford mentioned between the National Park Service, the American Institute of Architects, and the Library of Congress to support the HABS program. The purpose of the committee is to ensure open communication between member organizations to support, facilitate, and encourage the continuing activities and development of the Historic American Building Survey. In 1981, the Athenaeum and HABS announced the formation of the Peterson Prize, which is funded through an endowment from Charles Peterson and donations made to the Anthenaeum. A memorandum of agreement was executed for the Anthenaeum, National Park Service, and AIA to jointly administer the prize through the AIA HABS Coordinating Committee. So our role on the committee is not only to support HABS in any way we can, but help administer the Peterson Prize. 
Um, I would like to recognize the people that are on the committee this year uh, from the Athenaeum, uh, Bruce Laverty, who you know. Uh, from National Park Service, uh, Kathleen Lavoie, who's right here. Uh, Scott Keyes and Mark Scara, and Mark's here. And from the Library of Congress, uh, Mari Nakahara. And from the AIA, um, Ann Weber, who's a vice chair this year. Um, Ashley Wilson, Ashley's here. She's our secretary. Uh, Jeannie Gwynn. Uh, Jim Shepard, who couldn't be here today, um, Ann Sullivan, who also couldn't be here from today, uh, Sue Ann, and Sue Ann Pemberton. Sue Ann's here. I would also like to note that this being the 40th year of the Peterson Prize, we realized the prize had never had a logo. So we designed one. It is being unveiled here tonight. I hope all of you... Um, saw, if you didn't, please pick up a pin with the logo that will go on from today to help give an identity to the prize. And, you know, again, what we're trying to do with the committee is to promote HABs, but also promote the Peterson Prize. Uh, we see this symposium as the beginning of an effort by the HABs Coordinate Committee to promote the work of HABs and the Peterson Prize. We will be working on taking the exhibition that's here and presentations this weekend and share them at different venues, conferences, and publications. If anyone has thoughts on how we can promote this material, please let me or one of the committee members know, and we'd be happy to um, work towards sharing this information to a, a larger audience. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have done any type of HABs documentation? That's more than probably two thirds of, of the audience. Um, and how many of you have submitted or been an award winner with the Peterson Prize? I'll actually raise my hand too. <laughs> Um, I'd like to end by saying that, you know, for those of us who've been part of the Peterson Prize program and been award winners in it, uh, really to the students that are here tonight, um, you probably won't realize right now uh, the significance of your accomplishments in not only uh, doing the HABs documentation, but being a, a winner here tonight. Uh, you'll find over the years in your career that um, it's a very close-knit group of people that have done HABs documentation and have sat where you are as award winners. And you will bump into them throughout your career, whether it's in preservation or not. And, you know, I think one of the really neat things that you probably don't think of right now is eventually you'll be able to look up your name in the Library of Congress and see your own drawings. So it is really a treat, and we're really happy to be here with everyone and looking forward to uh, tomorrow's symposium. Uh, this being the 40th, uh, we are fortunate enough to have with us tonight the first winner of the Peterson Prize, um, Ann Weber. And Ann, you know, to show the commitment that all of us that have been working with HABs and um, the Peterson Prize, you know, 40 years later, Anne is still involved, and as I mentioned, she's our vice chair. And we asked her to come up and share some of her thoughts and reflections on her being the first winner and what that meant. So, Anne? Thank you, Carl. Um, it, it is kind of amazing to think that was 40 years ago. Um, but there are people here who were there at that time. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so in, in the summer of 1981, I was doing my internship for Columbia, uh, working on a historic structure report for 
the Mulford House in East Hampton, New York, a first period, um, double gable, beautiful uh, English frame, gorgeous house, uh, working for Daniel M.C. Hopping, who had been an original Habs delineator, and um, Frank Matero and Zach Studenroth. And they hired me to do the drawings of this house, which is maybe, I don't know, 2,000 square feet. Um, and we drew that thing, every inch of it. <laughs> it's kind of unbelievable. And um, we put a ton of information on the drawings. Uh, and it, in the end, they really didn't look like 1981 drawings as much as they did an earlier period drawings. Um, but I got really good at using the Leroy letterer. And um, so, you know, they, they helped me with the measuring and, and, you know, really understanding the building, which putting your hands on it and um, feeling the moldings and taking apart the walls to see where the original window jams were. It, it was just an incredible experience. Um, and I produced 27 sheets of drawings of the 2,000 square foot house. <laughs> On the doing the drawings, I did the drawings. <laughs> Frank and Zach and Mr. Hopping helped with the uh, with the measuring. So Mr. Hopping, being a very you know devotee of Habs, um, you know the drawings were both for the report and to give to the library, um, and he knew of the Beth competition and. We said, well, we should, we should do that. Um, and uh, I was also encouraged to submit by uh, Bill Short, who was an architect in New Jersey, in Princeton. And he had gone to the AIA convention in New Orleans in, I guess, 1980. 82, 83, something like that. And he came up to Natchez, Mississippi, where I was working. There was a tour. And he was on the Historic Resources Committee. And he said, oh, well, yes, that's very good that you're, you're submitting that. Um, so eventually, you know, I won this prize. And it was, it was presented to me by Charles Peterson in the AIA headquarters. In, the, in that great second floor atrium space. Um, and oh my gosh, it was just, I had not met him prior to that. Well, maybe I had, I, no, I had, we had come to, Col to Philadelphia on a trip from Columbia, and he um, conned us all into buying the Carpenter's Company uh, handbook. <laughs> so all of us, you know, pulled out our 20 bucks or whatever it was and went home with the, with the handbook. Um, but he, I mean, he was just like wisecracking away. I don't, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen Charles Peterson sort of going, going along. When my mentor, uh, Mr. Hopping, came in, uh, Peterson says, and here from the Republican suburbs is Dan Hopping. <laughs> But it was really a, it was really a great experience, and it really has brought me. Um, you know, it's still an important thing to me. Um, John Burns, um, I've met at that time, and he has recommended me, I believe, for both AIA and APT fellowship. Um, and. Uh, Bill Short, who was at that uh, meeting, I went on to work for Bill, Sh well, not for Bill, because he sadly died fairly young. Um, but I went on to work for that firm for 32 years. Uh, and now I've, uh, that was a credential Peterson Prize that I could use to go to work for Jack Waite, um, who also appreciated the, uh, the Habs. Uh, connection. 
So congratulations to you all. And uh, I hope that you can get as much out of it as I have. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, and, and um, thank you for it. I knew you could bring it home. You always do. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just want to thank everyone for being here to celebrate uh, 90 years of HABS documentation and 40 years of the Charles E. Peterson Prize, and, uh, and thanks to our host, uh, the Athenaeum of Philadelphia, and especially to Bruce Laverty, whose dedication to collecting and sharing knowledge to create an informed understanding of our built environment um, has benefit all of us. Uh, you have been an amazing guardian of the Peterson Prize and a dedicated friend of the program. So I want to uh, thank you very much. And in fact, you, have, you want to pull it out? So our, our, our traditional uh, Habs um, gift from, from years ago is uh, a salon board with a photograph of none other than the uh, at the name, but so we will we will take it out of the glass and all sign it <laughs> in in Hab's tradition. But just a little thank you from classic Jack voucher. Yes, yes <laughs> classic Jack. Anyway, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, give it back for now. Yes, no, definitely. You've been the heart and the soul of this organization. And of course, I want to thank our AA committee, and um, you've heard enough about that, and, and our, all our speakers. So the 90th anniversary is quite an accomplishment for a program intended only to last a few months. And I think it really speaks to the value of creating a legacy of our built environment for future generations and telling the stories of the past. And it's thanks to the dedication of untold numbers of professionals, students, and preservation-minded organizations to that ideal that has made it possible. And I'm sure, as we've discussed today, that includes many of you um, here tonight, um, and in no small part to the unique tripartite agreement that, um, that Ford talked about, the public-private partnership that brought together the National Park Service, uh, the AIA, and the Library of Congress, and, um, and many other partners, such as the Athenaeum. So together, we have amassed an archive of over 45,000 buildings, and I think it's a legacy that we can all be proud of. We've done this together. Um, but rather than look backwards, I'd like to look forward to the future of HABs. In the past decade or so, HABs staff have worked to keep on the forefront of architectural documentation, field testing new methodologies, and striving for quality and accuracy while still keeping true to the promise of serving the general public as well as the preservation professional. Uh, we do that by creating documentation in formats that are usable and long-lasting, as well as informative. So while new technologies such as laser scanning and photogrammetry, um, the final product is still the measure drawing on paper. Um, so the exhibition is intended to highlight our dedication to that ideal. Uh, and likewise to the types of sites that we record has grown. While we've been long committed to recording all types of building forms, from the monumental and architect design to the humble vernacular and utilitarian, HABS has greatly expanded the initial focus of the program on colonial American buildings to redefine what we deem to be historic. We now document the recent past and strive to be more inclusive in the groups represented by the buildings that we record. Hopefully that too comes through in the exhibition. Tomorrow's symposium presenters will speak to the value of HABs and its broad spectrum of users, its impact on students and professionals, and its place in the field of historic preservation and building con uh, conservation. Uh, then we hope to have a brief open session on the future of HABs and preservation in general. Um, but beyond the documentation among the most significant and rewarding undertakings is the commitment to the next generation, both in terms of the legacy that we create for them and our student engagement. So as many of you know, for over 60 years, uh, we have under undertaken this summer recording program that has introduced so many to the field of historic preservation, me included. 
Um, likewise, HABS has opened the eyes to the value of preserving and interpreting our built environment. Uh, receiving the student submissions is one of the highlights of our year at HABS. Um, the Peterson Prize composition has welcomed hundreds of budding architects and preservationists to the field over the years. And hopefully, as you all have suggested, Carl, uh, you'll carry that experience into your professional lives. To date, more than 3,000 students from 75 colleges and universities have participated in the competition, producing more than 500 entries and more than 7,200 sheets of measured drawings. So now and again, I worry about the future of HABs, but when I look at the drawings and I hear your stories about your experience, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll be okay. Um, so in addition, HABs, you know, we, we can't be everywhere. And so you help us in that regard, too, by rounding out the selection of building types and the regions represented. Uh, plus, we get to hear, learn from you, the students, the types of sites that you deem important enough to spend your time recording. Um, so cheers to all the students. Uh, congratulations and to their professors who have led them and to the many visionaries uh, that had the foresight to create HABs, including Charles E. Peterson, who we honor tonight. Uh, so with, with no further ado, let's get on with the awards and hear from the students. <coughs> In addition to uh, the certificates, which each of the students get uh, this year in honor of the 40th, we have created uh, special little uh, Peterson Prize pins, just like this one, that each member of the winning team and their professor will receive. Um, This year there was uh, a tie for third place. Uh, we added up the numbers and two, two teams tied, uh, <laughs> which is fine. Um, so uh, the first uh, team I would like to uh, bring up is the University of Miami uh, for their, is there a, a visual here? There we go. Is the University of Miami for their documentation of the Coral Gables Congregational Church. As is our tradition at the ceremony, we're going to ask uh, a team member to uh, give a short presentation uh, about their project. Um, well, it'll cut, it's going to cycle. Okay, it, perfect. So that works out. This is just, this is just background. Hi, um, we're some of the representatives from the University of Miami. Uh, we felt really lucky to be able to work on this project, um, so we're really excited to share it. Um, so the Coral Gables Congregational Church was completed in 1925. It acted as the first church and public building constructed in the city of Coral Gables, located in Miami, Florida. It's one of the earliest examples of visionary founder George Merrick's architectural aspirations for the city. In design, the church reflects the Miami uh, Bilt Bilt Biltmore, which rises across the park to the south, and on a smaller scale maintains the basal solidity and vertical tower. This strengthens the axis between them and creates a greater connection within the master plan. The community, it has a pillar through this church. Its architectural and cultural significance led it to become the first church listed on the National Register of Historic Places in the state of Florida. The construction and ornate faced edifice has allowed it to withstand the test of time and the strong community support allows for its continued preservation. Throughout the documentation process, we delved into the intricate details of the structure, unraveling the synergy between design and functionality. As we cataloged each element, a newfound appreciation for the meticulous and balance emerged. Beyond the drawings, the process illuminated the critical role that documentation plays in preserving the essence of architectural intent, fostering a deeper understanding of the built environment. Lastly, we want to thank our Professor Ricardo Lopez. We could not do any of this without him. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today, but we really appreciate his support throughout and his expertise and guidance. Thank you. Why don't two of you hold 
this. And, uh, <laughs> you can hold the certificate. <laughs> and we'll get some photos. Thank you. You want to take this with you off? Here's uh, here are the pens for Kevin, the one for Rick, and then uh, these are your certificates. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, the other team that uh, achieved a third place this year was Clemson University for their documentation of St. James Protestant Episcopal Church. Uh, I should mention that St. James was photographed by uh, um, Thomas T. Waterman back in uh, the late 1930s, so it's, it's great to have drawings finally come in for uh, this, this. It's a National Historic Landmark Church uh, outside of Charleston. So uh, the Clemson team would please come up. I'm Hannah St. Ange from Clemson, and these are my co-captains, Chloe Martin and Jacob Hawkenberry. And so St. James was one of the first major projects that we were able to work on as a cohort. And so it offered us this opportunity to learn both about each other and how to work together, while also learning about this absolutely incredible building. And so if you haven't had a chance to look at the drawings, the building was built in about the 17th teens. And it offered us this chance to sort of decode how the building has evolved over time. And it was a great exercise in learning how to read a building, as we like to say. And so to borrow a quote from our own professor, Amalia Leifesty, it's always a great day when you get to teach Willie Graham and Carl Lounsbury something new. And something that we were able to do was to learn that the gallery within the church was actually a later, but still early addition to the church. And so Jacob actually did a lot of work with that also using Craig Bennett's photography collection, so shout out to them for that. And so this was an exciting finding, uh, not just for us, but also for Ori Parker and the Vestry of St. James, who are the great stewards that take care of St. James and have really done a remarkable job upkeeping this building over the years. And so it was really special for our cohort to see how much it meant to them. There was actually some tears during our final presentation to them. And it was just a really great, great way to round out our experience of doing the documentation. And so it was also a privilege for the Peterson Prize submission team to return to the building towards the end of the school year to refine um, the existing drawings and also add some new ones. And so we spent a lot of time at this time getting um, into the nitty gritty of the attic framing as we tried to understand the roof framing structure's evolution over time. And so it was a challenge to discern parts of the attic as it was cramped, dark, and extremely hot up there. But it was really rewarding because we got to understand how the roof framing evolved and some of the changes you might come across when you're working in historic buildings. And so it was a really great opportunity for us to learn more. And we have to give a special thanks to our professor, Amalia Leifesty, for her wonderful support and also her red lines on our drawings, and also to the vestry of St. James Goose Creek that really gave us this opportunity to learn so much, to grow as preservationists, and also to grow as a cohort. So thank you to them. <laughs> 